that on the day of judgment, we will be the biggest gathering ever of human beings. Because all generations of human beings are coming together at one point. And yet this will be the day you will feel the loneliest. You'll be the most alone. You'll be separated from everybody else. And this is described in further more explicit detail. يَوْمَ يَفِرُّ الْمَرْءُ مِنْ أَخِيهِ وَأُمِّهِ وَأَبِيهِ وَصَاحِبَتِهِ وَبَنِيهِ Right in Surah Al-Mu'arijim wa وَفَصِيلَتِهِ الَّتِي تُؤْوِيهِ وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُؤْوِيهِ Right, so ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ Right, He's, he, he offers Allah everybody. He even says, separate me from my tribe in addition to my family. How about this? Why don't you take everyone on earth into hell? Let me go. He'll offer everybody else. Right, وَمَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا ثُمَّ يُنْجِيهِ Give, give everybody else up, just let me survive. That's what he's concerned about. So you become completely individualized on that day. وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَلْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ And mountains will become on that day like al-ihn. Al-ihn in the Arabic language is wool of different textures. You know, you have, and when you, when you make wool in Arabic, you know, in, in, it's not like they didn't have cotton really. They, all they had to work with was wool. It's not a society that had flowing cotton. Cotton was an import really. So when Allah makes reference to this kind of carding, usually it's associated with cotton, but in Arab society, the first thing that came to their mind was wool. So ihn is used wool. And then Allah uses the word al-manfush. The word nafasha in Arabic is to card and scrape into fine lines. You know when you card and scrape the wool, it becomes fine fibers, and then they're brought together and intertwined. And al-ihn is used for, for wool that is of multiple textures. And when you're carding, you know what happens? These really fine fibers, they start flying up into the air. They become weightless and there's this, you know, so you have to wear some court sign, I think, because you're gonna get like, it's the dust of it is gonna go in your, you know, kind of like sawdust kind of thing. But this happens with wool a lot. So Allah is describing mountains as this weightless thing that when it's scraped, it's almost like it's flying in the air and the different textures of it implied inside the word al-ihn benefits us in that mountains are of different colors. But they're gonna be slammed together and scraped together to the point where first of all, there's this different colored textured dust coming out of them, just like wool, when they're scraped together, subhanAllah. And, so we're, and we're, being, we're learning that mountains will not stay in, in one place. This is a day when everything's changed. You know, in, in this dunya right now, when you do, do good deeds, everybody around you says this is worthless. There's no way to it. And when they see a mountain, the first thing to their mind is, this is solid. Because their vision is that of what they can see, they accept. What they cannot see, they don't accept. But on the Day of Judgment, Allah Azza wa reverses this. And so the mountains become weightless, and your deeds are now heavy. They've been given thakulat mawazin. What an amazing contrast in this surah. The thing, you know, what, what will be weighed? There are different hadith and there are different texts in the Qur'an and Sunnah that allude to what will be weighed. Obviously, we know our deeds are going to be weighed. That's obviously there. Okay, the deed will be... Wait, and we'll talk about that in more detail. Allah Azza wa the hadith of the Messenger some allude to even persons being weighed. The Sahaba would make fun of a light-weighted Sahabi, right? Or his beard, he can't grow a beard, he just got one hair. And he says, beware of his beard, beware of that hair, it'll weigh, it'll weigh heavier than the mountain of Uhud on the Day of Judgment. Right? So, I mean, there, there's alluding to a person's weight. I mean, even the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in another narration, to a person who's very heavy set, but when he comes before Allah on the Day of Judgment, he won't weigh anything more than a mosquito. So, there's the weight of a person. Then, of course, there's the weight of our deeds. There's the weight of our deeds. And uh, some scholars even add to this the weight of our intentions. The weight of our intentions and our, our sincerity in our deeds. So, فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Allah says, as for the one whose scales became heavy, then those are the truly successful. In other words, Allah is not saying whose good deeds weigh more than their bad deeds. The, the real issue here is, your, your good deeds actually have weight. In other words, they were accepted by Allah. The intentions were good. The way you performed them were good. Mufti Muhammad Shafi rahimahullah added, if you want to make sure your deeds are heavy, do two things. Make sure they have sincerity and make sure you're following the procedure set by the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Don't come up with your own good deeds. Stick to those two things and you'll be safe. So Allah, and he says, in his Allahu A'lam, he says that in my estimation, the, deed, the, the weight of a deed will be judged by two things. How sincere you were and how close to the sunnah of the Prophet it was. وسلم, and you, the closer you are and the more sincere you are, the heavier that even the small deed becomes. It becomes heavier and heavier. May Allah Azza wa Jalla make our scales heavy. In other words, what we're learning over and over again is, good deeds have weight, bad deeds have no weight. Because when Allah seizes their deeds, Allah says, I will refuse to establish any wasn't for them. 
I will refuse to establish any wait for them. This is a contrast from what we read in Surah Al-Zilzal. We read, you know, when Allah Azza wa Jalla says, فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَهُ وَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ شَرًّا يَرَهُ They will see the weight, even the, the, the weight of a speck they will see. But it wasn't being weighed yet. It was just being what? Seen. But then the intentions were added. When the intentions were added, there was no iman in those intentions. They became weightless and now we come to these ayah. Now the scale is worthless. Okay. There they at least saw this. Maybe it's weighs something. Maybe it's something. But when they come to this, haba'an manthura, it's become worthless. وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فِي جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدُونَ And whose ever scales were made light. Now the word, I keep translating scales, but it's those things that are to be weighed also. Because mawzun, the word, if it's the plural of mawzun, it's not just scales, it's the objects that are put on the scale. If those objects themselves are heavy, or if those objects themselves are light, that's part of the meaning of the ayah. So it's the, the deeds themselves that are carrying weight. Then he says, okay, so if the deeds become heavy, فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ رَاضِيَةٍ Then he will be in Isha. Isha is different from Hayat. In the English translation, Isha, Hayat translated as life. Okay? Uh, Isha comes from Aish. Aish in Arabic. Which means to have a life in which you have no worry of food and shelter. Okay? Any life is Hayat. أَخَصْ مِنْهُ Aisha, Aisha there, there is no worry about food and shelter, meaning the necessities of your life are not a concern for you at all. Then you are in Aish. Those of you who speak Arabic, or, or Urdu rather, Aish karrein. Right? You know what that means? Oh, we're living it up. No worries. Right? That's, it's kind of derived from there. But the Arabic meaning originally is, is exactly that. It's to have a, a life free of concern. And this is actually the life that, that's described even of wild animals in the woods. Because there's no shortage of shelter and there's no shortage of... Predators especially, there's no shortage of prey that they can pounce upon. فَهُوَ فِي عِيشَةٍ Then there's the word رَاضِيَة The word رَاضِيَة literally means the one who is pleased. Literally it means the one who is pleased. So as an adjective of Isha, it's, it's actually unique. A life that is pleased. Hmm. A life full, full of pleasure. ذَاتِ رِضًا Which is how some of us have interpreted it is correct. A life that is full of contentment. But in the in Arabic rhetoric, you can say, you know, uh, 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 an overjoyed life. You didn't describe the person, you described the life. Right? You didn't describe the person, but you described the life. And this is so to understand that this, the entire life, not a moment, not a breath will go by where the joy won't be there. Not where the joy will be missing. Where the contentment will be missing. There will not be a moment of boredom or, or of, you know, of dissatisfaction. So, Aishatin radiya. ذات ردن as for example Al-Alusi rahimahullah says so and now we come to the, the, the horrifying next ayah وَأَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ as for the ones whose scales are lightened تَخْفِيف in Arabic to lighten and you know what's really cool about this on the day of judgment we want this huge burden of good deeds right but in this dunya when Allah gives us ahkam you know what he says يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ لِيُخَفِّفَ عَنْكُمْ Allah intends to lighten your burden from you in other words, when you follow Allah's commandments, life in this world becomes light. Light. You, life becomes easy and your scales are getting heavier in the Day of Judgment. The contrast between the two things in the Qur'an's language. So he says, And as for the one whose scales became lightened, the ayah ended, it didn't go straight to, it stopped there because he wants you to think. As for the one whose scales became light, you stop there. You don't just go straight to فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَةً لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِ You reflect on every single ayah. You stop and reflect on it. What's gonna happen? And how, what's the worst that could... What the kafir is saying, yeah, so it became light. What's the big deal? And Allah Azza wa adds, now He teaches. He says, فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَةً Both words, very, very powerful. The word هَاوِيَةً first. We'll come to um, which is even scarier second. We'll come to هَاوِيَةً first. The word hawi in Arabic comes from huwa, which actually means to fall into a steep canyon. And it's usually used for a hawk or a bird of prey that sees an animal way down at the bottom of the valley. And what does it do? It dives down at full speed. It's faster than even falling. When you're falling down, all you have to your advantage is gravity. But the bird is even forcing itself to launch itself further down, way, way deep into the valley to snatch its prey. That's what it's trying to do. 
in Arabic idiom, you know, uh, actually I'll, t- I'll tell you the idiom at the end. The word Hawiya is referred to by Imam Mazhari rahimahullah. He says that this is a canyon in hellfire so deep that only Allah knows its depth. So first of all, the location is such, and the one falling in it or the one going to Hawiya is what? Endlessly just falling way, 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 way down. That's described just in the word Hawiya. But then we find this really interesting expression of the Arabs. They would say for somebody who's having a really, really hard time or they're like... Uh, uh, they're in, 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 in a horrible, horrible calamity. They would say, Huwat ummuhu. Same verb is used. Hawiya, Huwat ummuhu. What that means is, his mother fell off a cliff into a deep canyon. They don't really mean his mother fell off a cliff. They're saying, man, you're looking like your mother fell off a cliff. But she dove right in. This, that's how you look. You look that depressed, you look that disturbed. Now, both words are used in the ayah, but the arrangement is changed. So Allah took the expression of the Arabs, but did something new with it. And this is again a feature of the Qur'an. فَأُمُّهُ هَاوِيَةً Then his mother, I'm translating literally, his mother is the deep canyon in hellfire. His mother is that deep canyon in hell. Okay. What does it mean his mother? أُمُّهُ We learn a few things from that. First of all, a child, it runs to its mother. And whether you like it or not, if the, if the person is headed for hellfire, they will run towards it whether they want to or not. Who wants to run to hellfire? Nobody. A child, you don't have to tell them to want to run to their mother. They naturally run to their mother. But on the day of judgment, your body will rebel against you. No matter how much you want to run away from it. وَيَصْلَى you know, uh, First he will say, give me death. Don't take me there. And then he'll throw himself in. He'll go himself. Jump in himself. Because he can't even help himself at this point. Just like a child can't help himself run towards its mother. The other benefit of the word ummuhu here is a mother wraps its child around and protects it and doesn't let it go. It's the sense of motherhood that she has. And also a mother, when she's carrying the baby, the child is inside and can't come out. He's inside. And you know what this implies? The, this, this, the, the mother for this person, the role of mother, the hellfire is gonna hug him and not let him go. And be very protective and owner, you know, owning of him. Not, let, not release him. And he's trapped in it like a child trapped in the womb of the mother. SubhanAllah.